Hello again. Uh, I'm still Andres Kotan, the president of the Alumni Association of the Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. I am still honored to welcome you to the last but not least session of the three in today's uh, discussion sessions devoted to searching for new growth in the Baltics. Uh, in the first sessions, we, we explored the macroeconomic trends and the environment. And uh, in, the, in the second, we, we uncovered some of the corporate and industry level considerations and aspects to take into account. Uh, but really, after all, growth is not possible without capital. And uh, to uh, really uh, make the discussion about capital availability for growth uh, reasonable, we wanted to combine both the capital providers and capital suppliers or capital consumers um, uh, together into a discussion to really tackle this question. Is, is, is the capital available in the Baltics to grow? And that is uh, what the session is going to try and address uh, now. Uh, when thinking about who could lead such a discussion best, we wanted to somebody uh, to, to find somebody who's uh, who's not directly representing either of the two sides. And I'm happy that Christine Jarve of Deloitte uh, uh, agreed uh, to this role. I think she uh, very well represents this, uh, in a way, independence, but then again, the professional competence necessary to discuss the topic. Uh, Christine is a, a country leader for Estonia and uh, Lithuania and a partner for tax and legal uh, services with Deloitte. Uh, so without further ado, I pass it on to Christine. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andres, and um, uh, welcome to the last panel of the day. It is my pleasure to be here uh, as a school alumni. Uh, I think uh, it's great to have a possibility for all of us to come together and uh, in this case, have a discussion. After previous two panels uh, that were discussing macroeconomic policy, as well as some winning and losing industries, let's focus on money. Let's think about capital availability in the Baltics and um, understand uh, what can be done uh, to uh, develop economies further. To help us understand uh, this topic, we have a panel which consists of both school alumni uh, as well as friends of SSE. And we will hear from uh, donors of capital, so banks, private equity, venture capital, as well as uh, some uh, businesses which have been are currently and will be in future potentially looking for capital. So let me introduce the panelists. Eva Tetter is a CEO of SEB, leading bank uh, in the Baltics. Uh, Christina Berzinja will be representing private equity side. She's a founding partner at uh, Livonia Partners. She's also a chairwoman of a board of Latvian Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, and she holds several board member roles in companies in Latvia and abroad. Gary Kodras is a tech investor and entrepreneur. He's a founding partner of uh, United Angels VC. He is an investor in Bolt, Moniz, Starship, Self, to mention just a few of uh, investments uh, he has uh, been part of. Helmut Bams uh, is a founder and CEO of Sonarworks. Uh, it's a music tech company. Um, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Latvia being able to produce something like this. Uh, it's, uh, it has four technology patents. Uh, it has uh, 70,000 recording studios across the world using the technology. And the technology is endorsed by more than 40 uh, Grammy Award, uh, awarded uh, engineers. And last but not least is Sasha Kelberg. Uh, he's a founder and CEO of Groglas, another amazing company with a very specific uh, and uh, niche uh, product. Uh, it's innovative solution to produce uh, anti-reflective glass. The company is uh, an exporter of its products to more than 40 countries uh, in the world. Sasha also has some background in private equity, so he will be able to share also from that side uh, uh, his views. So let me open uh, the discussion by asking Eva to give her perspective on capital markets in the Baltics. And maybe Eva, if you could focus on capital availability for small and medium enterprises, uh, as 
we have heard in previous uh, panel discussions, this is a backbone of uh, our economies. Um, how efficient is uh, capital market in financing these companies? Uh, how do you see your role in the market and what's your priorities going forward? On to you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and uh, hello to everybody. So really pleasure to be here and to share uh, the views. So I think when we talk about the um, uh, financial capital markets and availability, I would like to start with the view how generally our businesses are in the Baltics and how, how do we feel about it. So e economy in Baltics is pretty, is still pretty young. So we have developed 30 years uh, since independence. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we still talk about a very young economy with a very low accumulated uh, net worth. Uh, at the same time, we can see that the companies in our markets are already grown up pretty much. If we think about uh, changing the ownership, it's already like the second, uh, second uh, heritage uh, taking part. So companies are already in some life cycles developing. So I think it's both sort of young and also sort of uh, uh, grown up. So um, uh, what we can see, we can definitely see that during these times, the companies are getting better and better and capitalized. I just looked uh, about 10 years in a, uh, backwards, and during those 10 years, uh, the companies have increased their equity in uh, Latvia uh, 2.5 times. So, but the funding from the banking market has increased only by 16%. So, there is quite a big difference. And then, of course, the question is what the, is in the market and why it is so. And uh, if we look on the banking, uh, then I think that banks are generally very well capitalized, especially in the Baltics and Nordics. We can feel that the banks are uh, in a much better situation in capitalization and also in liquidity in comparison uh, to times pre-previous crisis. So very stable, very good industry. Uh, and the willingness uh, from the bank side to really support the businesses to lend, I think at least what, what I can assess is the higher compared to what the entrepreneurs are ready to take the risk on and, and to borrow from the banks. So my assessment would be that uh, the banking uh, capital uh, capital uh, funds or uh, funding is not fully utilized there is definitely possibility to utilize more and to get uh, uh, get uh, more out of uh, out of that so um, yeah and then of course the question is uh, what what is probably the benefits of the financial markets from from the banking and what are maybe the areas for improvement because of course if you look on the bankings and the positives definitely if the company borrows from the bank good partner stable partner you can trust long history um, uh, sustainable uh, values uh, i think also we you can always assure that uh, especially if we look nordics the interest rates uh, are pretty low, so margins are low. You can uh, borrow with a good rate. Um, but on the other hand, if you look what the banks are able and uh, capable to provide, definitely lower risk um, funding. So interest rates are low, but the risk what the banks are ready to take, of course, also uh, pretty low. And then I think... Uh, <clears throat> One thing which probably will be changing, and already the bank's feelings that what is changing is the regulation. So increasing regulation definitely restricts banks to take on more risk. So for the banking market to act flexible, to act agile, to be available to adjust to the corporate uh, and uh, business needs, it's getting less and less because we see that the regulation is growing. And uh, I would even challenge with the question, all our panelists, do we see that the um, universal standard historical banking will change soon because uh, most probably the businesses are a little bit looking for some uh, different way of uh, funding than the banks can provide. 
So I would say so. My my first uh, first assessment, Christine, for for uh, for the discussion is a very stable uh, stable industry, very well capitalized and ready to land. On the other hand, of course, with the uh, low risk outlook, we are. Uh, looking what uh, what can we uh, onboard in our books yeah are we ready, ready to onboard everything um, so feeling is that the financial capital is not uh, any more a uh, scarce resort i think it is uh, available uh, it's abundant and at the same time it's cheap the question is how really to utilize it effectively yeah Okay, thank you. Um, when we talk about, uh, let me bring you back to, to maybe, uh, again, small and medium uh, companies, would you say it's the same approach from banks uh, to small and medium and larger companies? I think there is a bit of a yeah. view in the market that banks are there for large companies and mm -hmm. those uh, are having all the access to capital they need. <laughs> Of course, uh, it is different. And of course, uh, large corporations definitely have much easier access to, to financial capital, definitely. On the other hand, if you are thinking in ideal world, I would say that for the country as such to be, hel to be healthy, it, the SME businesses, small and medium enterprises are really like backbone. I would be saying that if you want the economy to be strong, you have to have a healthy pie in your economy uh, represented by small and medium enterprises. So that market share should be uh, healthy and pretty sizable uh, to make the whole ecosystem working, uh, working well and stable. On the other hand, in practice, that's not how it works. Also from the bank side, the bank would love to see that at least 30% of portfolio is uh, dedicated to small and medium enterprises, uh, but it's not so easy to ensure. And uh, I think that uh, small and medium enterprises definitely feel when they need uh, bank finance, they have uh, less competition around them. So uh, when a larger corporation in the Baltics are announcing tender, then there are definitely like seven, seven uh, participants in a tender. If a smaller company is coming out, then uh, it, the competition is lower. That definitely means that the price is higher. And I was thinking, okay, so what, uh, uh, what does it mean? Why it is so? And I think we are still struggling with uh, topics which we have been bringing up uh, several times and uh, which are not only on the corporates or on the banking. I think it's uh, together for the, the whole uh, ecosystem and also the government to address. I I'm still thinking about transparency, how to make sure that uh, uh, transparency is good enough for us to be ready to lend. I'm still thinking about uh, uh, governance is the governance of small and medium enterprises good and uh, healthy and stable for us to trust it and, and to be ready to lend? And I'm still thinking about, uh, can we really improve somehow the uh, part what government can, uh, can support us with some state registers? Let's take uh, UBO, uh, ultimate beneficiary owners. Let's say uh, know your customer register. Let's say uh, politically exposed persons. Let's say taxpayers, whatever registers, because when it comes to small and medium enterprises, I would be happy to lend just based on the, on the information from these registers instead of digging into each and um, individual uh, borrowers uh, books and trying to understand can I, can I trust these books so i think there is also some um, some work to be done by uh, country by the whole ecosystem and then of course uh, some parts to be done uh, uh, together banks and the companies how to improve that we can trust each other with uh, existing transparency, existing governance. Um, yeah. And the one thing which, I, which I'm also thinking that uh, from the very practical, uh, practical experience, um, probably there, there need to be some stimulus for, uh, for small and medium enterprises really to 
take the risk and to be willing to grow because what we see that in many cases when you reach some level in the business you say okay this is good enough i'm uh, uh, pretty safe here uh, what is uh, in the next growth step what is in for it uh, for me into it to, to really take it so i think sometimes the willingness to take the risk is not so um, hot to to take this jump and then maybe there can be something from the government from the tax uh, regime that companies are saying yeah there is uh, something for me also to take the next step so sometimes also this um, growth uh, uh, gross risk is higher for the small and medium enterprise. They don't feel safe enough to take it. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sure uh, we, we can ask that question to some of our panelists because we do have uh, representatives sure. from business. So once we uh, go to Helmut and Sasha, we'll see their view on uh, willingness to take the risk. Let's move on to private equity and uh, Christine. Uh, and Christine, I'd like you to address the same questions I asked uh, for Eva, uh, because you are part of a market uh, which is addressing uh, small and medium enterprises. So how, do you, how efficient do you think uh, is a uh, capital market uh, in Baltics for uh, these companies? Do you see any gaps in the market? Uh, do you have any suggestions what can be done and how do you see your role in the market uh, as compared, for example, uh, banks uh, in this case? Hi, 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 everyone. So, um, yeah, I am uh, Christine Bersen from Livonia Partners and uh, may maybe starting with our role just to provide some context to, uh, uh, to, to this conversation. We are a private equity fund uh, investing into Baltic companies. Um, uh, you know, our investments range from, let's say, you know, from, I don't know, 5 million to 15 or, or, or a little higher with, uh, with co-investors and partners. And uh, our portfolio is quite diverse. Um, we, it's, it's mostly uh, so-called uh, buyout transactions. As Sieva was mentioning, you know, there is a lot of this generation change uh, in among entrepreneurs is going on, and that's like a bulk actually of uh, our investments. When uh, uh, entrepreneurs who establish companies in uh, uh, 90s are ready to exit, um, and uh, uh, and uh, you know, generate some um, uh, generate proceeds for for the family. Um, and also we provide growth capital, uh, which basically capital invested into companies to, to, to grow, but in, in a later uh, stage, not, not in the early adventure stage. Um, and uh, um, we definitely don't see a shortage of investment opportunities, just the opposite. I mean, I, I think um, uh, we are in a very, uh, we are in a very responsible business. Uh, what I mean by that, uh, we definitely are not donors of capital. <laughs> what we are managing is basically money of um, uh, pensioners, today's and future pensioners. And we cannot afford to be donors. We, we have to generate a very, very high return. Uh, and, uh, uh, and having said that, we have to be extremely responsible with our investments. You know, they have to be, of course, uh, uh, you know, totally transparent, totally, you know, in line with all ESG requirements and so on. Um, and uh, with these criteria in mind, we absolutely don't see shortage of investment opportunities. Um, you know, our portfolio is, you know, before right now, uh, before we, we just exited recently, one company was eight companies across the Baltics uh, and the investment universe uh, for us, we kind of estimated uh, in several thousands of companies across Baltics, and there are fantastic investment opportunities coming up all the time. And uh, you know, we started investing from Livonia in uh, uh, 2015. In 2015, and it's already a very different market. I think Baltics, generally speaking, and economies. Uh, and of course, there, it's, there is no surprise, as you know, Eva said, it's, it's still a very young economy. Uh, exactly, and five years out of 30 is a lot. So no, no wonder there, is, uh, there has been such a great change in the last five years. 
So, uh, so, so that's kind of uh, where uh, what we see, and you know, it's a, a very strong uh, pipeline of investment opportunities. Um, speaking about other uh, pockets of capital, um, of course, we would like, we would love Baltic banks to be more. Um, um, how should I put it? To take more risk? Of course, that would be fantastic. <laughs> and I, I think, uh, generally speaking, Baltic banks are quite conservative. If we look at very, very similar situations in, I don't know, Sweden, Nordics, continental Europe, and so on. Having said that, uh, there is just no other explanation to this as these are young economies and these are not uniform economies. You know, uh, I think banks are still de developing expertise in, uh, in different industry sectors. Every, you know, a year ago, we tried to refinance an IT services company, fantastic company. Uh, some of the banks told us large banks, not small pocket banks, they have never financed an IT company. So they actually don't know how to do it. You know, a company which does not have a, a big factory or, or, or a big pledge. So that's, that's just the feature of the market and, and of the economy. So, uh, so we have to be really sort of uh, creative and uh, more invest more equity uh, than uh, you know, our counterparts in, in the Nordics would do, for example. I mean, normally I think uh, kind of leverage and bank financing levels are much higher um, uh, in other economies, more and more established economies. Um, and, and then, of course, uh, this whole universe of younger companies like, you know, Sonarworks and, and even younger companies and, and that's uh, and very, very young companies, you know, it's um, uh, it, it, it's a totally different uh, universe again. Um, on one hand, uh, you know, everybody knows that the very early startups how can they raise money? Uh, I mean, it's it's a usual, you know, friends, um, friends, family, and fools, right? Three Fs, um, uh, and it's a <laughs> it's truth across all economies. It's it's not better somewhere else. On the other hand, you can actually say in the Baltics, uh, the infrastructure and the uh, government developmental institutions uh, support. Uh, to uh, for younger companies is pronounced much stronger than uh, than elsewhere. You know we have a series of uh, early stage funds. We have a series of accelerators and so on, who are being financed by government development and institutions. And as you know, in our view, this is a very great help to um, to to the sector. So there is just no question about it. This is really really needed. And uh, all the governmental, you know, development agencies, Altum and uh, Credex in Vega, in, uh, in Vega, and then uh, also institutions like uh, European Investment Fund, European Investment Bank, EBRD, they are doing, you know, absolutely fantastic work to uh, to support uh, younger uh, younger companies in the Baltics. How would you uh, look at the foreign private equity uh, and you? How are you operating in the market? Uh, are you complementing uh, each other or you would say this is more a competition? Uh, and are there any gaps in the market? Uh, still some ticket sizes which are not addressed. Um, that's, that's a very uh, good question. I think in the... Uh, in the... Um, uh, say, in the deal size where we are investing, um, we don't see uh, a lot of foreign private equity as others. Occasionally, yes, uh, but fundamentally this for them is still too small. But, but, but again, I think what's important to say uh, where uh, what happened in the last five years, they have been uh, tremendous, fantastic deals in the Baltics, very large deals when uh, uh, large private equity funds came into into the region, you know. And again, this is a big, big change from where we were five years ago. Of course, you know, uh, Blackstone's acquisition of Luminor, you know, one billion euro deal. 
you know, uh, Andreessen Horowitz investing almost 300 million into TransferWise, um, or Providence uh, Equity investing first 300 million into um, Bit, and then another 100 million to, to buy a uh, media company. Um, and uh, so on and so on. Deals like that, they did not exist uh, some, you know, five, five, six, seven years ago. And this is just putting Baltics on the map in a totally different way. So it, it, is, it is creating this, you know, um, universe for exits, you know, and, and so on. It, it, it's just, uh, it is just something very, very special, which has been happening in the region. Uh, lately, and uh, um, and new investors are coming in. You know, of course, you know uh, Sasha. <laughs> you know Sasha's uh, grog glass uh, has attracted uh, Katija, who had never invested in the Baltics before, and new investors are coming in. And I think generally, it's a very very good sign. Thank you, Christine. Uh, so now we could go into venture capital. And uh, here I will ask a question to Gary, uh, who uh, is mainly focusing on technology companies. So um, when, when you look at capital availability, um, would you say there have been changes uh, in the sector you operate uh, over the last years? Uh, what's the direction? Is there more or less capital? Uh, yes, I, I, I think I can draw quite a good comparison because uh, compared to the time when I started investing to startups, which was like almost 10 years back then, uh, then uh, especially in the last you know, three to five years, as there also has been real big change in the tech financing uh, uh, and, and, and early, especially in the early sec sector of tech financing, uh, which is especially you know, hard to, to, uh, to achieve. So uh, yeah, so when, when I started around at that time, 10, 10, almost 10 years ago, then, uh, the local startups could only rely on relatively small number of local business angels to get funding from, and and even the number of business angels for, was actually you know you can count you could count them on like maybe maybe fingers of, of one or, or two hands, and 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 uh, there were basically you know maybe you know five years ago there was like okay one or two VC type of you know entities in the Baltics for a little bit later later phases. Uh, and and a lot of current uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, superstar startups like Bolt for example they were really struggling raising early rounds like f five years ago, but uh, I think uh, now yeah the situation really has has changed a lot, and uh, so on, on one hand to the very early phases actually there there has now evolved a new segment of the uh, wealthy uh, angel investors because actually a lot of uh, or num number of uh, founders have uh, partially cashed out, like for Christine I mentioned here, uh, TransferWise, actually TransferWise founders have, have cashed out quite a lot and, uh, and are very actively investing now in, in the very early phases. The same goes to to, to number of other big startups. Uh, and also instead of, you know, maybe one, one or two funds five years ago, right now there is around 10 VC funds. And uh, and uh, and a lot of them are also run by you know ex uh, entrepreneurs. So so it's it's not just money. It's also actually smart money that a lot of smart money that has come to the to the segment. Uh, and um, so uh, uh, and and the same actually goes to to foreign investors and and VCs, which also maybe you know five years ago go really I very very rarely saw a foreign fund investing to this region. But but right now I get the call, you know, every every week uh, from from a foreign uh, VC actually wanting to uh, you know be familiar with the Baltic ecosystem and, and be here to, to really re ready by the time that some some good companies start to start to raise money then also be aware of of, of this region and and and, uh, and and a lot of them have taken this uh, into their their scope. Which, which, which wasn't the case you know, a few years back. So on one hand, I think what has contributed to it definitely is this you know, like virtuous circle or, or snowball effect or, or how you call it. So yeah, like, um, like maybe 10 years ago, there were only few tech startups that, that had made it big, like, like Skype, which had its roots in Estonia and you know, Forticom or One, which had a headquarter in Latvia. And, and, and 
uh, especially Skype, like for example, it generated hundreds of people who had seen how to build a global company. And, and a lot of them created their own companies, you know, including Transferwise and Bolt. They, they, both of their founders include uh, you know, Skype, Skype ex-employees. And now uh, we are seeing the third uh, iteration or, or kind of the third round that a that lot of these second wave companies have grown big enough. And there are really good high quality teams coming out of these companies with employees who have thousands, now already thousands of people actually who have seen how to build a global company. And now they are raising money and, and they can, they, their quality is so good that they can already quite easily turn to, you know, already in early rounds, they can turn to, you know, European or, or US investors. And, and we have seen a number of such deals uh, in, in this year uh, hap happening. Uh, yeah, so so I, I think uh, this 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 uh, this definitely has been really good effect, especially in Estonia, also also to some extent uh, in in Lithuania, maybe a little bit to lesser extent yet in Latvia. But I also see already first evidence that in Latvia it's it's also there is you know more entrepreneurs who who already have previous experience from somewhere else and who who actually can attract also more capital and 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 not only local capital. And uh, yeah, also I can I can add to to Christina's previous uh, previous uh, comment as well that I, I also fully agree that the, the uh, good job also has been done by the you know local government level and and EU level like three years ago for example EIF opened this program where they agreed you know to be one of the limited partners to VC funds in the Baltics and and this actually. Uh, you know, made it much easier to attract or, and raise also private money to these funds. So, so that has been one of the main reasons why, you know, the, the, the number of VCs ex ex expanded, you know, like two, three years ago. Uh, um, um, yeah, I, I think this is, this is maybe, you know, where, 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 I, where I see that the in industry uh, startup, uh, startup financing industry has moved during the last maybe three to five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gary, would you say that there are some gaps in the market, uh, maybe specific uh, type of uh, companies where financing is still difficult to come by? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, most of most of uh, angel investors and VC fund managers actually still feel most comfortable with uh, uh, in the tech field. They feel most comfortable with like software or internet related startups, which which are technically relatively more easier. And also there have been success cases in, in these fields. Uh, uh, but, but where I still feel there is a gap in the market or disadvantage is maybe a more science intensive or, or deep tech type of startups. Like um, it, it, uh, it again comes both on the founder quality, you know, like usually a few years back, if I received some, uh, some business plan uh, from, from uh, you know, uh, entrepreneur who, had, who, who was still a scientist who, who grew up from university, usually you know, it was like three pages of, you know, deep text and without any, any attention to how to grow a business out of it. But now I have started to see actually that, that there is also more high, more better quality, uh, quality teams starting to come out of this field. And I, I also have personally put a lot of attention and, and, and time actually in helping uh, uh, now uh, you know to go to the kind of the next next level in, in this this value 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 chain and also to to help uh, the entrepreneurs in in these more science intensive fields to to be in the level that they were able to 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 raise 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 money and and uh, yeah I, I I think there there is actually from Estonia now one good case just last week was announced a company called Skeleton raised forty million so they are maybe the fir first such company which had a good science background from Estonian University and then, then basically has grown it already quite deep, but there is really no breakthrough yet and also there is no community yet in this field. So, so I, I believe that that's where the gap is and yeah, it requires actually both educating these type of founders to be able to raise money and, and uh, yeah, and, and, and maybe also change their mindset, you know, so far their mindset has usually been very much like grant oriented uh, you know, which is fine, but uh, it's 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 not it's this alone is not enough for creating like a really big company, uh, big science intensive uh, deep tech company. Uh, so so that that's that's I think where a lot of the attention could be going in the in the in the in the next maybe few 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 years.
Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you, Gary. We are getting some questions from the audience. Uh, and I can see that there are a couple for you, so I will drop them in uh, at this point that uh, links very well to what you were saying. So the first one, uh, do early tech investors feel the crowding effect due to plethora of public money being thrown into the market? So do you feel it that there's too much money and uh, you have to almost compete with the public money uh, on your investment? Mm -hmm. No, actually, you know, too much money can mean that the number of if the start if the number of startups or high quality startups were the same, and the amount of money would would increase, then you know, of course, there could be excess resources. But in my opinion, and also if I look at the statistics, uh, then 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 uh, then actually the number of uh, both number of uh, startups quantitative, quantitatively. Who have raised money, and also number of uh, of high quality startups, which which I am seeing in my work, has has also increased, and maybe has even increased in a higher pace. So definitely, there is you know more more competition right now, and it's not only that the amount of public money is bigger. It's also maybe because you know lot, much more foreign funds are now starting to invest here uh, already in earlier phases. So so the competition for uh, for uh, you know, local investors has definitely increased, but but in my in my view, actually, still it's not to this extent that the companies which which would uh, not be worth it would get in, getting the financing. So so I think right now we are still in the point that actually the number of of startups getting uh, the money and number of good quality startups is has been increased in the same base or or, or even higher. So so yeah, I, I, I'm not not yet seeing this. Uh, this problem in, in this. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, and the second question, um, well, answer it if you can. It's uh, more about uh, practicalities. So your thoughts on investing uh, into startups from Latvia uh, in legal process or uh, how easy or difficult it is compared to Estonia. And maybe you know something about Lithuania as well as recovering Baltics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think actually there isn't, uh, in terms of like e easiness of investing, yeah, that way is you know almost as 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 easy from a standard stand a startup investor's point of view to invest you. Okay, there are some some aspects, some practical as aspects. For example, you know this e-signature, which is maybe more widespread, widespread, or or maybe you know more, more you know more, more e easily usable in Estonia. But overall. Mm, yeah, if, if actually I charge, I also have few investments in Latvia. If I charge, it's 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 not from government's perspective or from the kind of legal perspective. It's not more complicated. Maybe it is still complicated for uh, actually later phase investments to to uh, to convince uh, them to invest to Latvia as compared to Estonia. But this mainly comes down to just you know the few of the really good success cases having, you know, Estonian legal headquarter and you can, you know, like a few years back, we had this, in a way, Estonia had the same issue that if a foreign investor want, wanted to start, come in, in the round A, they wanted the company to move to London or, or, or change the headquarter to Delaware or, or something like this. But now actually everybody can say that, okay, guys, you know, Bolt has Estonian headquarter and so many big private equity companies, they, they have invested already, they have already validated the, the, the Estonian ecosystem. So from the market perspective, perspective, it's actually, you know, Estonia has an advantage, but, you know, if, if I really compare the effort, it's, you know, I, I think Latvian system is, you know, has the same level of, you know, e easiness of management and, and the systems are relatively similar. I don't see a big, big difference. You just need a, maybe a, just, there needs to be a good case, you know. Hopefully, uh, SonarWorks or Nordigen, or there will be a case which, which you know, will will create a similar marketing advantage also, also for Latvia. So, okay, let's hope so. So let's move to SonarWorks helmets. What are your views uh, on the market? Um, how do you see the situation? Has uh, COVID made it more difficult uh, to raise capital for startups? Do you see any other challenges? How is your business doing? Right, so I'll, I'll first drop in a, a little bit of context because we actually have very different stages of the market that we are discussing here. So where we fall in is in the venture capital field. So we are a, a still a startup company. We are generating revenues. You know, some product lines are already profitable. So the revenues are in millions. So it's kind of that level, but we are not yet 
you know, a, a huge private equity sort of uh, company. So still a venture capital startup. So that means also the risk levels are higher. So uh, one thing that, you know, uh, I think I, I agree mostly to what Gary just said. I would only probably from my perspective add that there is I feel there is somewhat more of a difference from Estonia to Latvia, where Estonia is considerably more ahead of us. Uh, like Giri is actually talking about like the third wave of companies in Estonia. Uh, I don't believe we have actually fully had the first wave in Latvia. So I believe that put us like maybe five years behind uh, Estonia. So uh, things are, and, and Lithuania is actually kind of at the moment when you look at the earlier stage startup scene, uh, Lithuania is actually kind of developing now faster, uh, I think, than Latvia. Uh, so in, in our case, we are a VC company. We actually fall in that particular category that Gary was describing. We are a deep tech uh, company, so fundamentally based on technology, which kind of makes it a bit more complicated because you, you might need more funding and earlier stages uh, than other companies because of the tech aspect. So one thing uh, when it comes to particularly, so if you look overall, I think the, the capital is there overall, especially when you talk about, like in our stage, you go out of the Baltics, uh, you know, you don't, you don't look at the funding in terms of the Baltics, Baltic, uh, because, you know, once you are fully like VC level at the moment, I think one of the changes that has happened really, like Gary also mentioned, you know, you know there's, uh, basically, most of the funds in Europe would actually be looking at the whole Europe. So you're not competing. The funds are not competing from like one Baltic fund to another Baltic fund. There's the whole European pool of like 100 funds that are competing for basically the same market. In this respect, Europe has really opened up uh, and has become like one uh, big market. There is, I, I, uh, if I look at our case, we have investors from from Lithuania, from Estonia, from Denmark, from Turkey. So, uh, and, and this is just like one example. So I think you very early start getting this very diverse mix of uh, investors. Um, if it comes to COVID, uh, it's an interesting aspect there uh, when it comes to COVID. So when you, when you look at later stage companies, uh, you basically look at them by looking at the books, right? So that's the main thing. You have to kind of analyze the financial data and you can actually get the whole picture and understand what kind of risks you are taking on. Uh, when, it got, when you go to earlier stage, uh, and earlier stages, it's, it's much more about future dreams. So it's much more trust-based. So this means that much more than in later stages, you are basically investing in the team and there has to be a level of trust. And now COVID fundamentally actually changes that uh, equation because before COVID, I mean, if, 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 if look at this, like imagine you are a fund somewhere in Europe and you now want to invest in a company in say Latvia or Estonia. So uh, first of all, you would want to meet those people. And before it was kind of easy, you would kind of fly around and meet people and, and get a feel of whom you are actually dealing with. Uh, and COVID fundamentally changes it because it's so much more difficult now to build trust because your question is not so much of understanding, you know, what kind of thing they put down in the Excel. Uh, you actually want to, you know, talk with the team and understand who these people are. So, and in, 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 the, in, in COVID uh, time, it becomes much more difficult because doing that online is really not the same as uh, doing it uh, kind of uh, physically. So one thing that changed was uh, as the pandemic hit us, uh, I think basically all the venture capital funds, first of all, they turned internally to manage their own funds. Uh, like, you know, you have a fund, uh, you've done like 10 investments, all of the companies are continuing to raise money. So as the COVID hit and everybody understands, okay, it will be much more difficult to build trust. The first thing that everybody did was they did internal rounds with the current, you know, investors that were already on board. Uh, why? Simply because it's so much more difficult. Like at the first instance, nobody actually in the VC industry, I think very much understood, like how do you actually kind of build trust on a level where I'm comfortable investing like a million in a risky startup. So uh, I think what is happening now, you know, initially everybody was like, put the external investors and pause investments and pause and kind of looked at the internal fund. 
And now I think everybody realizes, okay, this is kind of here to stay for some time. So we actually have to get things moving. So now I think everybody's trying to accept the reality and looking for ways of how to actually do it online. But it doesn't happen overnight. It's, you know, uh, I think the analogy of when, when, when a company attracts equity investor like a VC, it's really like a marriage. Like you find your partner and you marry. Now imagine that, and it probably like, I don't have to do this right now. I'm married, but I guess like people are individually going through the same thing. Like how do you actually meet your spouse in the time of pandemic? Like through chats or like, how are you supposed to build the trust and understanding that you want to like, you know, be together for life. So VC type of investments is kind of similar thing. Uh, and now everybody is trying to figure out, okay, how do I meet my next wife or next husband, like on an online environment where we can't actually meet. So uh, I think that movement is happening. We're not there yet. I don't think that like most VC funds will say, yeah, we are now completely comfy. Like we'll just do everything online. So the online deals are starting to happen, but it's not a new norm. I think everybody is learning. So that was one big disruption where kind of the external, you know, I was exactly at the time when I, I had to raise a new round. And it's just like when the pandemic hit, it's complete, everything completely stopped on the kind of external um, investment rising. So we also did an internal round. Um, when it comes to, so as I said, we are uh, dealing kind of, first of all, European level, our particular case, and I think it's it's it, it, it's a specifics when it comes to tech industry and like deep tech stuff. You know, technology doesn't really have borders. Like if if you invent a new technology, it just it's it's it, it, it's it's right. It's global. You you can't have any technology which is local, except if you do some I don't know, like communism technology. Maybe then you know like limited to specific countries. But tech in general is global. So we are a deep tech company as such in our particular case we we sell software also to consumer electronics manufacturers and in this case if you look at consumer electronics europe basically has completely lost out on that industry that industry is still, it's only like us and china basically well korea is also a big player but there's nothing really happening that much in consumer electronics in uh, in europe so so I am talking to Chinese investors and to US investors. And, and if I think about, you know, what has been changing? Well, actually the China uh, US trade war is affecting me very directly because I now have investors like from the Chinese side that are saying, okay, if we get on board, uh, you actually like the investment can't go to US. Like if you have a company in US, we actually do not invest. And sometimes you get like a uh, similar kind of stuff from the other side. So, uh, so Europe in this way has opened up. Globally, there are now some cracks forming up like between China and, and US. And because I'm in the consumer electronics space, it kind of affects me uh, quite, uh, quite directly. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the picture as I see from my, uh, perspective when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to venture capital type of investments. Okay, and um, if, if we uh, pick up a question which was given by audience to Gary uh, about this public money, do you see uh, a lot of state support? Do you see uh, public money around and is it benefiting you as a company? Well, I, 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 frankly, I can't talk about Estonia and Lithuania, uh, you know, uh, building a company, you sometimes get so busy that like, uh, you know, because I can't benefit from whatever is there in Estonia. So I really kind of don't follow it. Uh, if I look at Latvia, then you like, you, I think it's almost non-existent. Like uh, we have Altum and we were actually one of the lucky companies we actually managed to get like uh, a small support loan from Altum at, at like exactly at this time when the pandemic hit us and our fundraising uh, stopped uh, for a small time. But uh, like in reality, there wasn't any tool actually for that. We just managed to do it through the existing mechanisms that Altum already had in place. And it was great that we were able to do it, but I'm very well aware that it's not going to be kind of not all the companies will be able to do that. Uh, 
and the problem is that these tools, these instruments that they had were not specifically designed for this type of environment, like the pandemic that hit us. And you also have to look at it in relative terms. So when I'm a tech company, who am I competing? I have like nowhere even close anybody competing with me Baltic wise. I have a competitor in Denmark, in uh, in Sweden, and I have a competitor in Germany. So then when, when you look at the like checks and balances, from my perspective, then I have to compare how is my support compared to the company in Germany or to the company in Sweden. I can say like, you know, quite clearly that support for early stage startups in Germany in particular was just through the roof compared to uh, Latvia. In this respect, Latvia's support is like non-existent. Germany, France actually did massive programs to actually pull more money into the earlier stage uh, companies, uh, multiple mechanisms, how they do it, mostly through existing venture capital funds, uh, uh, also doing, you know, programs directly. Uh, Latvia actually doesn't have a, uh, a specific program for startups. So in this perspective, uh, Latvia, from a Latvia kind of, if I look from a Latvian perspective, then I'm I'm at a disadvantage compared to my competitors in Germany or Sweden. They They actually got more support. I don't know, Gary, maybe you can comment how is it in Estonia, because I really don't know. Yes, it's it's basically uh, the pub public money comes in, in two levels. W one is that, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the funds can uh, can have some uh, public institutions as, as LPs or basically the government programs as limited partners. And secondly, yes, yes, as you, as you mentioned also during the COVID period, there have been a specific programs towards actually they were targeted towards every company, but every SME. And, and there was a specific problem that they actually they stipulated the company to have some kind of a profit during the last years or something which startups never have. So actually the, the, the startups had to lobby in order to, you know, also be able to qualify. And, and actually a lot of startups didn't didn't qualify for this uh, this this program so so there and, so, and therefore actually it wasn't um, uh, as useful as for example like the french or uk programs which we, where i know where there were very specific programs targeted towards startups and and some of my portfolio companies in the uk really benefited from this and, and you know it, it it's it's it saved their life but but yeah in in estonia you know, there was a way if, if the company was big enough, then there was a way to apply directly, like like Bolt did, but, but you know, because of some political, you know, undercurrents, they, they couldn't get it. So they finally got from pri private money. But yeah, so situation wasn't ideal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that's, uh, that's very much how I also kind of feel in Latvia. Uh, and I, I do know about these programs in like Germany and France, and they were basically driven from a political level where they basically said the startup ecosystem is actually super crucial. Mm -hmm. And kind of the idea, like it's a, we had this problem in Latvia, I think already, we run it like actually into it multiple times. Like, you know, whenever startups start uh, financing their activity from venture capital, you're basically like on steroids. So you grow bigger muscles than your bones are ready to support. And you cannot cut that supply. Uh, if you cut it for a while, you just basically die. Your you know, muscles crush your bones. And, uh, and in Latvia, we have had several times when we had the gap actually, like one round of funds actually end and the next one start like after a year. It's like, hey, come on, you just kill everybody that has, has just like, you know, uh, uh, put its head out of the water. So, uh, so, and and Germany just did like politically. Hey, we have to save. Uh, we have to save these startups in bulk, at least through the COVID times. Uh, so, and we don't have that level of support in Latvia. Okay, thank you, Helmut. Um, let's uh, talk with Sasha, who has a company in a bit different development stage, I would say. And uh, Sasha, you, uh, a couple of years ago, you uh, executed the management buyout transaction and uh, attracted a new investor. Uh, and I understand this is not the first time a company has raised money. Uh, how was this different? 
Um, what were the circumstances? Uh, how did you go about it? Um, and did you have a preference for a foreign fund? Uh, Christina mentioned uh, already that this was a, a first investment for this specific fund. Um, yeah, please share. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, just like Helmets, I'll start with a little bit of context. Uh, we are also a deep tech startup, also, uh, which means that we're very capital intensive and uh, the capital markets have to be fairly mature uh, to finance something like that. So we were quite lucky and I think we were an exception at that time that our money was very patient. Um, uh, the NCH, I, I founded Groglass with while working for NCH and NCH investors are uh, pension funds and mostly university endowments uh, with uh, so-called an infinite time horizon and their funds are you know 15 year uh, long funds and that was I think one of the key reasons why we were able to you know poke our head out of the water because uh, historically such you know one out of 10 such greenfield startups they they die before they reach uh, any positive uh, cash flow um, so I should say that you know I will tell you a story but it's not it wouldn't be applicable to perhaps many companies at that same stage. Um, we were able to, and that was, we raised mostly all the funds from NCH and the NCH founders were um, very averse to any leverage. So we were we did not go to any banks. And so we were entering the uh, transaction a couple of years ago completely unleveraged as well. Uh, so that was also quite different. So the, the, this, the, this is, uh, um, it, it, this is the difference between the current uh, environment. Now, when we uh, were ready, so when NCH was, you know, every patient fund, I think, loses its patients at some point, but it was not, uh, the, the, the fund became already 14 years old, which was at, at the end of its exit stage. And I approached the fund, seeing the big opportunity in, for growth in the business, I approached them and asked to do an MBO. Uh, which they uh, agreed. So management buyout, this means that we wouldn't be talking to potentially strategic buyers, but to financial buyers. And that's, I guess, another thing to consider when you are uh, uh, raising money is, you know, to raise strategic money or financial money. Of course, uh, if you do see your role uh, as a manager in the company um, and that you would play a major role, then financial sponsor would be uh, probably a lot better because strategic may have some other considerations for your business. Now, uh, we were also at a, at a size uh, which is probably not typical for uh, a Baltic. Uh, we were between five and 10 million EBITDA, which kind of put us somewhat above um, the threshold for a lot of local, local funds, um, still competitive in uh, when they would find coalitions of, of uh, uh, investors, and that's still possible to be financed on a local level, but it attracted a lot more global funds. So we um, went out to, I think, 60 funds, and we hosted about 20 of them, um, either here or uh, on the phone, but mostly here. And what Helmut was saying about um, how COVID impacted it, it really resonated with me because I could not imagine a fund which did not invest in, in the Baltics previously agreeing to take the leap, not only without you know, physically seeing uh, a, a manager, but really without being here. Uh, Latvia, I think, has a lot going for it in terms of a place, uh, a great place to be. So we, you know, almost every investor who came over, they were pleasantly surprised. They loved the place. They, it's, it's very comfortable. It's easy to understand. And, um, that it is important, I think, that we get back to a normal physical interaction. Um, somewhat, something we'll be able to do online, but I think to attract a new, a new investor, it would be impossible uh, to without physically uh, having them here. Uh, our uh, universe was made from mostly European funds, but some global funds looked at us. And now if it's not European, typically we were right below the threshold. They look about 10 million EBITDA and they say, okay, we could reduce that, but it has to be some, something really exceptional. So our um, funds were uh, European funds. So I think the size contributed a lot to mm -hmm. our us going with uh, a, a European fund and uh, the fact that they were comfortable with it. We wouldn't be a large portion of their portfolio, which was also important to us uh, that you know, we 
would be working with them. It was important that the fund had strategic uh, connections uh, that would help us grow because our business is not in Latvia. Uh, we were born in Latvia and we produce things here, but we sell things uh, all over the world and uh, good European connections were, uh, was important for us. Uh, of course, chemistry and, uh, and, and these things are extremely important as well. So our considerations were from size as well as um, from yeah, chemistry. Okay, and uh, when you talk about the size uh, and considering what uh, Christina already spoke about, about uh, different uh, participants in the private equity market, uh, would you say that there are any gaps and would you, uh, would you see that there are certain company size which is a uh, disadvantage because uh, of uh, not uh, being able to fit within the uh, characteristics each fund is looking at? No, I think the bigger you get, the more access you have. Uh, because uh, it's uh, it's always difficult to be, I think, raising, and I would not want to be in the shoes of, of of a super young company without cash flow, without a proven concept, because it's such an extremely difficult thing to prove to someone that you're real and that your ideas could work out. And, and frankly, they, you know, many of them don't. Um, so the bigger you get, uh, the better it is. Uh, and I think that you only get more advantage by. Uh, by being able to show that it's worth for someone to come in. And someone's not going to come in for the first time for a small deal. Uh, they will probably look for a, a larger deal if, if, if they weren't exposed to the Baltics before. And uh, any key takeaways or suggestions for other companies looking for capital? Uh, how do you suggest they go about it? Uh, what's in your experience? Uh, uh, could help them, uh, or is, is is there even something what you ha would have done differently uh, if you knew what you know now? Looking for capital, we were extremely happy with the outcome. Um, I would say conducting a transaction. Um, one, one thing I would do differently is I would probably staff up. Um, this is um, a process that is likely to take six to nine months if it's a large uh, deal. Um, you everybody at the top of the management will be 120% involved with the transaction. Um, it takes a lot of your personal time. Uh, if you have a lot of funds, uh, you're really uh, entertaining a lot of them. I mean, it's a couple of days per fund. And then if whoever you let into the final round, it's going to be three types of due diligence for every type of fund. And they're going to be very involved. And at the end of the day, uh, the worst thing that can happen during a transaction is your underperformance during the transaction while you're still negotiating the price. Uh, so this is uh, what I would say is that before you go in, make sure that you have people who can absolutely and definitely take care of the daily business because you're not gonna be running it. it you have to be superhuman to be able to do that. And uh, so staffing up and making sure, but it's always good to have people who can replace you. So that's, uh, I think I would uh, recommend that at any stage of the business. Uh, one thing uh, that I also noted, um, doing vendor due diligence before uh, you go into the transaction. So going through the due diligence yourself uh, from the safety of your own home, uh, being able to address all the questions. Uh, you don't want to have surprises at all during the due diligence. You will have surprises, but you want to be able to mitigate most of them. Yeah, I understand the uh, SEB was involved in the transaction as well. So. Um, Maybe Eva, uh, how, how does it uh, fit with uh, normal transactions you have? Would you say this is something which should be very typical or, or this is an exception to the rule that uh, you would be involved in this type of? Uh... Yeah, uh, I think that uh, this, uh, I still would say that it is uh, quite exceptional in the Baltics. And uh, I like that uh, Christina was mentioning already that the banks are um, maybe a bit uh, too cautious towards the risk, also very like um, standard based. And we are not really eager to take something new, uh, to onboard something new. And usually the banks are looking to finance something where they are closer to the hard collateral, closer to the operational business. So it would be very difficult for us to finance um, 
holding companies or uh, the real uh, like uh, owners. So also in this case, we went into the operational company. So close to the business, close to the operations. So the cash flow, the collateral, the business, that's what we uh, finance. Uh, but I think that uh, we did a great match. So uh, that's, that's uh, what we are after to get the trust to, to get this understanding whom we are financing and, and then we can um, we can set the deal. And uh, this time it was really, uh, I would say it was a great success for all of us. We, we did the deal successfully, but I would say it's not an easy transaction for the banking. Yeah, the, the, I would second that, that uh, it, it is, it has been a great deal, but at the time of uh, the transaction was very difficult to, yeah get across uh so we we were looking at several banks and it was it was a lot of very difficult conversations even though you have strong performance and strong um you know background behind you it was it was difficult to find a partner even no. finance a, a, par a portion of the deal and Christina, maybe uh, going back to back to this, I think that the trick is that the banking uh, market in Baltics have uh, experienced very deep crisis during 2009, 2008, much deeper probably than uh, even in other countries. And uh, that was the first time for banking industry in our history in the Baltics and to go through that and to probably lose uh, profits which we recovered within next afterwards like within 10 years of course it is um, difficult for the management for the shareholders to accept uh, increased risk so yes the banking in the mm -hmm. Baltics uh, taking into account the shareholder structure is very like um, risk aware yeah no I, I I fully agree with that that it's actually it's amazing to realize that it taken uh, uh, since it's taken more than 10 years and we still are talking about after after shocks of that crisis right more than 10 years and it, it's going to continue like this and uh, what's what's also i think resonates with me um in our experience for us much easier to 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 raise uh, leverage buyout financing from banks in estonia than in latvia that is just it's 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 really uh, there is a big difference and again it goes back to Eva, your point that I, I think latvian banks suffered the most in in that crisis 2008 2009 so there is still this historical memory and uh, um, yeah very very much affecting but today. not not to drive uh, the point too too far uh, home but now we have another crisis on our hands uh the last six months and uh, I think banks were very quickly to go into the crisis mode and to uh, become ultra conservative you know even against the strong uh, uh, financial performance uh, we received negative uh, feedback mm. we actually have a quite different experience uh, I think Helmut was saying this about venture capital uh, funds when you know the crisis when COVID uh, COVID pandemic uh, kind of hit the Baltics, everybody went into, you know, the self-reflective mode and started looking at their portfolio. In a way, for a couple of weeks, we did the same. Of course, naturally, we started like working on a daily basis with all portfolio companies to make sure that there is enough liquidity, that the business is not affected. And we immediately started talking to the banks. And actually, I have to say, in all cases, the conversation with, with commercial banks have been so, so constructive. Uh, in one case, uh, actually, SAB in Estonia for one portfolio company, just we didn't ask. They sent us a new agreement to increase overdraft. We didn't even ask. It, it was amazing. Uh, so, but at the end of the day, we didn't need it. Uh, actually, they, they, our portfolio's exposure to, to COVID um, it was uh, very, uh, very low. But, um, but yeah, I, uh, we, we had extremely positive cooperation with banks. This brings us to the questions from the audience as well. And uh, uh, again, uh, this, this is more for Eva. Uh, the question uh, says that most businesses have a feeling that local banks cut lending after 2009. 
and they never really increased it back. Does uh, data suggest anything different? Uh, thank you for the question. So um, I don't have data in front of me uh, back to 2009, 2010. I have data back to 2014. And I should say that uh, um, the feeling of the companies is uh, right, because if you look on the portfolios, what the banks are holding, they have not grown uh, significantly since 2014. Uh, so they are more or less uh, on this flattish level. So the portfolios which have grown is uh, much more on the private part. So private business, uh, private individuals like mortgages and, and private lending has definitely been increasing uh, um, in all three countries uh, steadily. So the reasoning I think could be different, could be also still, as, as we discussed, a little bit like this uh, feeling from the pre -crisis, uh, previous crisis. Um, difficult to judge what exactly has made this um, situation that we have not been actively growing. So um, maybe also some structural changes in the banking market, if you look on the Baltics. Um, so uh, Luminor was uh, established, so maybe that sort of slowed down a little bit like appetite. Uh, capital was required, funding for Luminor, now they are um, much more stable, up and running. Um, yeah, but the feeling is uh, quite right. We are, uh, um, we have not decreased, but we are flattish, I would say. Mm -hmm. And another question from our audience, again, for uh, banking sector. Um, how would you assess the market competition in corporate lending across the Baltics? Uh, is it fair to say that Latvia has a, a very mild competition between uh, the banks? I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say so. I think that competition is still pretty uh, active. And as I started uh, in the first, uh, first round, uh, when it comes to large corporates, I think that uh, if there is a good, uh, good uh, tender on the tables, and there are at least seven, uh, seven financing uh, banks ready to to participate, and it's even, uh, I think competition is even growing because some of the companies are uh, obtaining. Uh, more uh, diverse shareholding and we see that uh, now for example also like uh, uh, Japanese banks are ready to to uh, come into the market so I think competition is growing of course depends on the risk depends on on the deal but in general I feel that uh, overall in uh, market and looking broader not Baltics, uh, I should say, probably Europe, maybe even more broader. There are liquidity pretty high. And what we can see as European um, interest rates are kept negative. So the banks are pushed to uh, keep low uh, growth of the deposits, uh, either to lend or to keep low growth. So um, we see that foreign investors are trying to approach also the Baltic companies through different other means as Baltics are getting better credit ratings. So we are much more stable. We have grown up. We can demonstrate that we are a good place to invest. So we see that, for example, shareholders are, uh, instead of keeping their cash in the banks, I don't know, in Denmark or, or Germany, they are happy to provide to their subsidiaries or to their uh, uh, counterparts like to, to somebody who is uh, a dealer of, uh, of uh, goods, uh, German goods, easily gets funding from Germany instead of borrowing to the local banks. So I think that there are quite, uh, quite a uh, change in the market. So it's not always that companies are approaching even banks, banks only. So we see that uh, like uh, working capital funding is coming uh, in very actively from outside of Baltics. Thank you. Um, let's talk about future. Uh, and um, in one of the previous panels, uh, we already heard that the uh, EU is thinking about the uh, potential investment gap and they are uh, considering that the uh, Green Deal is important, digital uh, aspects are important. How do you see uh, this and what do companies need to take into account? Uh... The 
Okay, Christina, is it addressed to me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is open okay, to, okay. for all the panelists, but you could start, and then we see. Uh... I I can start, and I think that everybody will uh, be ready to add something. So I think that when it comes to the green deal, uh, financial sector definitely plays quite a key role into that, and uh, we can see that if Europe has assessed that uh, to achieve Paris Agreement uh, by 2030. Uh, they will have to invest into infrastructure about, I think it was 180 billion per year. So it's a huge investment to to drive through the European uh, Green Deal and to get to this uh, neutral economy. So, uh, and of course, the money goes through financial uh, sector. So that's why we are playing a very significant role. And of course, we will be regulated on that, that we play it uh, correctly and uh, we play it according to the rules set by uh, EU. So um, I think currently what we see is that green, it's not any more like it was a couple of years ago. It was a bit of a fashion saying that uh, I'm uh, transforming towards green. I think nowadays it's... Uh, very, very topical for us. It's already like a planet-wide issue and everybody have to address. What I can definitely see is that those companies who are um, who have decided on transformation or on the change yesterday or even today, they definitely will be success. Those who uh, postpone it to the later day, uh, sorry to say, I think that there will be not so easy future for them. So at SEB, we have started already some time ago, several years, and now we have assessed uh, industries and uh, we have 29 categories of, uh, of um, um, uh, our customers uh, by climate neutrality. So we are definitely ready to support our customers into transition, transformation towards uh, green, uh, green. And uh, I think that's definitely our priority. Um, I know that everybody is asking whether it will be more cheap. Uh, to some extent, I should say yes, because that will definitely affect our capital. We will be asked uh, by our regulators to keep uh, uh, more green uh, investments and to get uh, get away from the brown ones. So uh, that will definitely definitely drive also price pricing and also availability of the funding. So that's just for intro. Mm -hmm. I would second on the private equity side during our uh, transaction a couple of years ago, they, there was a fund which had the mandate uh, that uh, their investments had to be uh, contributing to the climate change. Uh, and, and we actually had to look deep at our business plan and see whether we were complying or not. Uh, and some of our markets were indeed complying. So there, there, was, there was a fit, but I do recognize that there will be a lot more focused money um, on both the environment as well as the social responsibility, as well as uh, kind of the B Corp uh, movement uh, that, that, that is happening when, when you look at just uh, your attitude, not only toward the environment, but also the community as well as to your employees, to safety, uh, becoming more of just the bottom line type of a transaction. Um, so I do suggest that everybody keep an eye on it. You know, if you cannot monetize it today, as Eva said, there would be uh, an opportunity to monetize it later, or at least not to suffer from the consequences of not being that type of a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from actually venture capital point of view, I can also tell that so far they're actually, bo most of the investments to this segment, they, they have been done by, you know, maybe separate uh, ones, funds which, which have as part of the mandate that they need to invest to something which is related to green tech, but now more, more, and more, I, I, I see, and uh, and that, that that actually it's it, it it will not be like this anymore. It's actually uh, will become much more important, and you know, I, I would even say that may, altogether the the all green technologies for a, for a, a you know inv investment segment could could present an opportunity during the next ten years, which is in its size equal to what the uh, you know internet economy was uh, emergence of internet economy so so 20 years ago so 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 basically I, I i really feel that the opportunity is of you know almost like equal size considering you know 
the, the, the size of the problem, what the green technologies will be solving, uh, and, and the scope of these problems will be of similar size as, as the type of things that internet helped to solve and, and, and made, made possible. Really, I'm, I'm a big believer in this segment, and you know, already in this year, actually, a number of the few of the, you know, in the smaller scale talk, talk, then number of the uh, bigger investments have been to green tech companies uh, in, in in Estonia, with this, like Skeleton Technologies, for example, and and uh, and, and a few more, and, and definitely we're going to see much more of them. I, you know, I, I think on my side, I would add, I would want to bring a, a, another topic on the table uh, because I mostly represent, you know, pure tech and software. So as such, kind of software is green in its essence. Uh, uh, so what I think when I, when I look at the tech and software uh, sectors, I think the big future game is country-wise about talents uh, because if you are building technologies and building, say, software, it's all about the availability of talent uh, that you have access to. So I think what's, uh, what, is, what is a big deal, if I look into the future, is uh, a so somewhat more competition and a bigger battle when it comes to attracting talent, you know, when you look at, say, Europe and where does the talent land. So if I think about, I think actually Estonia is pretty well placed there, where I think Estonia has more and more cases where it can actually bring talent to Estonia, thanks to the kind of stronger ecosystem. Uh, and I think that the question, you know, other Baltic countries have to ask is like, will we be net attractors of talent in the future or will we be donors of talent in the future? Uh, if I look at the Latvian ecosystem, I think at the moment we are more donors than attractors. And it's Estonia is now, I think, you know, starting to attract actually some talent from abroad, uh, and uh, and that that's going to be a big uh, game. Uh, uh, so I hope we can actually move to a place where we are a net attractor of talent. And maybe to add on uh, on, on the subject uh, uh, from um, from our experience. And uh, uh, at Livonia, we basically we spent uh, a better part of this year uh, discussing internally how we would like to approach uh, green investing. And we had many, like the whole team, we had many discussions on a weekly basis, very heated discussions. And uh, we basically came to a conclusion that what uh, one, we are not uh, like, we're not going to invest into green companies, pay premium, and just hope that somehow uh, we will exit from those investments uh, in, a, in a good way, profitable way. What we do want to do is to tackle the issue. Uh, uh, you know, we will invest into companies which uh, need capital and knowledge to fix uh, fix fix problems. Is it climate change or uh, generally speaking environmental issues, you know, waste or biodiversity and so on and so on. Um, we actually pledge to ourselves to dedicate part of the capital of, um, uh, of the funds to uh, fixing environmental issues at portfolio companies. Um, and uh, uh, and that's that. I think we made this pledge to ourselves. Um, we are going to uphold it. Uh, and even more complex part of the issue is not only money, but also kind of changing the behavior at all decision levels. And uh, it's difficult. It's not easy. I mean, we are working with our portfolio companies now, and it's just so easy to, to get into this, uh, you know, normal routine uh, and talk about things which, you know, we're used to talk about for, for many, many years. And, and then, and we, we need to teach, teach ourselves also to, to, to sort of uh, bring this uh, item of the agenda to every single conversation. So, yeah, we are going to invest into uh, solving these uh, problems in our portfolio companies. Uh, some of our fund investors keep asking us, does it mean that your return will drop, returns will drop? Uh, 
And we strongly believe that it does not mean that. Uh, the truth is right now in investing world globally, uh, nobody actually knows because uh, uh, there, there have been no like uh, environmental investment funds who have produced very, very strong returns. Uh, it's, uh, and the game is changing uh, all the time. And, uh, uh, you know, as, as companies are becoming cleaner, uh, greener, uh, our, through, uh, our belief is that the next investors will be uh, uh, paying uh, higher and higher uh, valuations for, for these kind of companies in uh, years to come. And Christine, maybe we can um, handle a question from audience uh, on this topic. Uh, it also goes along the lines that you were discussing that you maybe are not necessarily ready to pay more for an environmentally uh, friendly company. Um, the question is, uh, are there any examples where a company or a fund has been successful in attracting significantly more private capital thanks to its focus on environmental matters? Do you know of such uh, situations or such uh, examples? Uh, I believe this exactly. This is changing like all the time. And, and right now the, there is a wave of, uh, uh, you know, more and more interest from investors at every level, you know, pension funds, uh, uh, international institutions, you know, uh, family offices or fund of funds from, uh, from other uh, other countries uh, uh, and so on. This this is changing exactly exactly now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, as we are approaching to the end of our session, uh, let me ask you all uh, uh, another question. And uh, uh, on this one, I would uh, appreciate a quite short answer. So, uh, do you believe there is too much capital in the market? Just enough? or not enough capital. So Christina, maybe um, you could start with your view. <laughs> um, I, I think it's impossible to, to, to say it in general. Of course, the market is such a complex place and uh, uh, you know, both in terms of Companies development uh, uh, development stage or uh, or sectors or you know green investing uh, it's it's a very complex uh, complex place and uh, uh, what I do want to say that investing is people's business it's a relationship business there can be so much capital in the market, but at the end of the day, it, it's all about like having a, a proper, you know, a trustful relationship between investor and, uh, you know, the company and management and founders. Uh, so in a way, no matter how much capital is in the market, it, it's all about people and relationships and so on. Okay, thank you. Eva, what's your view? Too much, just enough or not enough? I would uh, definitely agree with Christina that, uh, yes, there is uh, liquidity, there is capital, but it uh, goes down to the trust and uh, relationships. And I would really wish all of us to balance out this capital availability, financial availability with uh, need what is really urgent for us that we have skills and capabilities to transform these great ideas of growth into products into um, services which we can afterwards afterwards also monetize and that uh, that goes to towards this green uh, economy for us so let's balance the funds and uh, all the other resources which are to some extent even more scared Thank you, Eva. Sasha, what's your view? Um, well, Christine took words out of, out of my mouth. I do believe that there's plenty of capital, but uh, talent is, is what's driving uh, the willingness with which this money is being spent by those who hold it. So um, really nothing else to add. I think we need to work on exciting projects and uh, there will be money to finance it, be it private or public. Thank you. Gary? Yes, I think in, in tech financing, the amount of funding is, I would say, just enough. I definitely don't think there's too much of it right now, but there are segments which are underserved, I believe. 
like I, I, I feel that the kind of yeah more more, more deep the type of companies uh, which require more mature capital markets they 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 are still underserved. But it comes with in a way it's natural order of things that this you know it, it's on the way. Hopefully in, in three to five years when we talk you know we we can conclude that that this part also has been kind of fixed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Helmut. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I, you know, mostly because we come from a very similar stage. I agree with uh, uh, Getty that uh, there is enough capital. You have to look into the specific, you know, segments uh, where the capital uh, is going, and in some of them there might be imbalances. If I think about Baltics, uh, I would like to step, uh, make a step back and look at like what's happening overall. So. What, what, what has happened in the Baltics is basically, you know, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you had like a completely underdeveloped economy. So what happened this far was mostly adoption of ready-made models, you know, how the insurance work, how the banking work, how this and that established industry work. And all of that has been adapted. So what you have right now is basically, I think more, more than that, you have a lack of... Um, opportunity when it comes to where does the fundamental growth happens because we are out of the opportunities when it comes to you know making more insurance companies and making more electric uh, supply of electricity and you know the the fundamental stuff and uh, we are now in a stage so there's definitely enough capital we have to learn how to uh, basically uh, get more growth out of that capital and i don't think that the growth is fundamentally going to come from the uh, all the conventional sectors. Okay, thank you with that. I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I would like to thank audience for being patient and staying with us on Friday afternoon and sending in quite interesting questions as well. And with that, I will give it to Andres to say some final thoughts and close the event. Well, yes, um, on behalf of the organizing team, this is uh, another Round of thanks to, to, to you, Christine, for moderating this uh, very diverse panel of very uh, high profile and experienced and very diverse perspectives on, on the question that really we didn't really intend to have a yes or no question. And, uh, and, and, and I think uh, that is what uh, we really experienced. Uh, it is a question that's much more fragmented and multidimensional, whether uh, there is or there is not enough capital. Although at the end of the day, I think we, we, we came to a very, very, very specific conclusion that capital is not the only resource required for growth, uh, that maybe talent and, uh, and the team and the business ideas are actually the ones that come, come first. And um, with that, uh, I think uh, I will uh, again, say, say thanks uh, to all the participants of this, uh, this session and, uh, of course, all the other sessions as well. I think, um, uh, and, and, and since, since this is the last session, I will also want to say uh, thanks for all the people behind the event. I think uh, we uh, not only uh, reached the target, but actually uh, outperformed our expectations. 1,000, almost 1,000 unique visitors during the uh, three sessions is, I think, uh, a result we, uh, quite frankly, didn't expect. And um, I think it shows that a quality debate and discussion is, is something that uh, can compete also in the remote world, uh, that uh, the type of discussion we could organize today, which is pan-Baltic uh, by experienced and qualified people is, is something that is, that is always um, needed. And in that sense, I think we, responded in, in some way as the alumni of these, this school to the mission that the school was founded, uh, which is to contribute to the uh, development of the Baltic region. And, um, uh, and, and uh, so, but that would not have been possible if, uh, if, if the speakers were, uh, were, were not responsive, as responsive as you were. So thanks again for that. Um, well, to, to conclude, uh, again, a few practicalities. First of all, yes, all the three sessions will be available for, for watching later. Um, they are probably already on Facebook, uh, but uh, they will also be on the YouTube channel of the school. So feel free to, uh, to go browse through them if you couldn't uh, today or if you have still um, items you want to digest. Uh, at least I have 
So I will uh, we'll probably use that opportunity. And um, uh, as to the alumni, again, two small um, uh, reminders. First of all, uh, go on and vote on the Alumni Association board members. We have the annual rotation. So express your vote there. And the other is an encouragement for you to sign up to the contributing members campaign of the Alumni Association uh, in this uh, uneasy year for fundraising. This is uh, an important uh, way of how you can contribute to the activities of the association and in our attempts to help uh, and support uh, SSE Riga. Um, and maybe the final uh, remark, uh, since the socializing aspect is of course a very challenging one this year. Um, maybe my suggestion is that pick, uh, pick your course mate, uh, not the one that you are regularly in touch with, but the one you have probably not spoken to during the past year and, and, and make that call uh, and have a chat. That will be a, a small reunion that we can have this, uh, this year. And hopefully things are a bit different next year uh, when we can meet again uh, in person. So thanks again for the, all the people involved and uh, have a nice Friday evening. Bye-bye.